MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Hello again, everyone. This is the My Fantasy Podcast brought to you by MySFantasySportsTalk.com. Brandon Reed here, going to be joined by Dan Shaw, the founder and lead writer for MyFantasySportsTalk.com, and Kyle Kirby, lead contributor for MyFantasySportsTalk.com. We have got a big show, of course, as always. Uh, Thank you for listening to the podcast. We're going to be talking a little... Uh, franchise tag, NFL franchise tag today, and we're going to be playing a little game called uh, Tag or Pass. Uh, I'm going to bring up a few guys that we think uh, their team should either tag, put the franchise tag label on, or pass. going to be talking about some NBA trade deadline news, too. The trade deadline has passed us. We're going to review some of the trades that were made on trade deadline and see which teams came out ahead of that. And it's almost tournament time, almost March Madness. NCAA Bubble Watch is going to be another topic on today's show. It is Monday, February 22nd, so let's get into the show. Bring it in, Dan Shalk and Kyle Kirby. What's going on, guys? Hey, how are you guys? What's going on, everybody? Doing good. Uh, another big Monday for us, and uh, just briefly, a little bit off topic. I know uh had a WWE pay-per-view last night. I know, yeah. Kyle, you watched that, wrote a good article on that, so everyone check that out. He uh, uh, wrote an article on the build and his predictions for WWE Fast Lanes. That's currently up on the website, myfantasysportstalk.com. Check that out. How did you think about the – what did you think about the pay-per-view overall, Kyle? Oh, my God. This could this could easily be its own podcast. I could go on probably by myself for a good hour on this. Uh, it was good. I mean, the matches were fine. The actual, you know, the actual build to every match and the results weren't that great. I wasn't too pleased with the uh, the main event there. I, I mean, I, we we were you and me were talking about it a little bit before in the chat, uh, Brandon. But you know, I I won't go on too long. But it just seems like they don't really know what they're doing and they're not listening to people when it comes to this guy Roman Reigns, who they're just pushing like crazy, like they think he's the Rock. Seems everyone, to be the golden boy, huh? Oh yeah, I mean it's terrible. I think they think he they want him to be the Rock. He's not the Rock, um, but it's you know it just it just hasn't been very good. I wasn't too happy with it last night. My but my boy is Dean Ambrose, so not too happy with what happened to him. And I saw a little bit kind of a spoiler of something that happened to him that's going to be aired tonight on Raw. Oh, uh, let's just say uh, he he was attacked early on. Um, So uh, I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to spoil anything. But anyway, yeah, I kind of felt the same way. I think they're in a tough position leading up to WrestleMania. Just I'm not feeling it, and I think they've kind of painted themselves in a corner. A lot of that due to injuries. So, Mm -hmm. uh, But, yeah, WrestleMania about six weeks away. And which brings me to my next uh, topic I wanted to mention uh, real briefly uh, with Dan. Dan, we're added some new categories to MyFantasySportsTalk.com. We're not just fantasy talk. We're not just sports talk. We've added the wrestling segment, and we've also added a movie reviews uh talk a little bit about some of the new things going on at my fantasy sports talk dan yeah yeah it's actually pretty exciting we've uh created a whole new entertainment section uh that's going to cover not only movies tv shows music uh, i know uh, malachi just uh reviewed the kanye west cd um so that's up there but uh, it's a whole wide array just to kind of give a whole new audience a perspective um kind of introduce them to some sports too because on there they can see what we have to to share on the sports sports world as well and we've got walking dead previews yeah. um and also uh, deadpool a couple of deadpool articles uh, currently as that's one of the one of the hottest movies out right now so uh check that out uh your your source basically for all sorts of information in the worlds of entertainment uh period entertainment period my fantasy sports talk.com but guys let's jump into our first topic of the show here uh, and that is NFL franchise tag. We're going to be playing a little game we call tag or pass. And uh, first one up on the list, let's talk about Kirk Cousins. What's going on in Washington, period? Uh, what's going on with Kirk Cousins? Which which guy, Which guy? one of you guys wants to take this one first? I'll let Kyle have that one. Okay. It's a tough one. Uh, I'm a little bit conflicted. I, 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 I'm going to go with tag. I think that's the best way for them to go. I think that this is a, obviously it goes without saying. I'm gonna go through the whole, all the cliches. It's a quarterback-driven league, blah blah blah. But you know what? There's not enough good quarterbacks in the league, and this is the truth, to really let someone like him go. 
is he worth the money that a franchise tag or a big deal would be would be giving him? I don't think so. But I mean, you gotta look at his recent performance. The last nine games, he only had two of which that were uh, that he wish he had a passer rating under a hundred. Pretty good. Twenty touchdowns <clears throat> and two interceptions over that stretch. Pretty good. Plus, he is the main reason why his team got to the playoffs, which is something that Redskins fans, I'm sure, were very pleased with. Um, I think you got to tag the guy. He's he's definitely a talented guy. Is he is he worth you know top five pay? He's not worth top five pay, but you got to do it. It's just the way that this thing shook out for them. They have to pay him. Dan, uh, yeah, I pass. No way. Uh, Kirk Cousins. That's I mean, it's Kirk Cousins. I his stats were impressive. In, in 2015, you know, he only 11 interceptions. Uh, I can I can give him credit over 4,000 yards, but it is a, a pass happy league. But franchise tags 20 million dollars. I mean, that's that's a good chunk of change. And I mean, just I'd wanted to give him some benefit of the doubt, so I I wrote out every single starting NFL quarterback, and I could only see five that I would take over Kirk Cousins. Or, or five that I would not take over Kirk Cousins, making 20. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was about to say you, you really the opposite way on me there. Okay. 25. I'm with you. I'm with you. 25 <sighs> quarterbacks I would take over. <laughs> so I, I, I can't I can't justify the paying of, of $20 million to, to Kirk Cousins. And Andy Dalton was not one of them, was he? <laughs> I would take Andy Dalton over Kirk Cousins. <laughs> okay. And his, broken sure. finger, <laughs> and his terribly broken finger. <laughs> Yes, me me and Dan kind of ribbed on each other back and forth over the NFL season about that. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, I had him on my fantasy team, and I thought he was setting the world on fire. But that was early on in the season. Uh, Dan left left him out of uh, a couple of his top twenty QB uh, articles. Um, so I was right for a little while, then I think he ended up ultimately being right about um, Andy Dalton. But anyway, continue. I I, I just uh, I just would not pay him. He's just it. With their with their draft position uh, and in the quarterbacks that are out there, I would rather take a quarterback in the first round, later in the first round, say uh, a Carson Wentz, Jared Goff, if they last that long. And and the reason they got into the playoffs, I know you said Kirk Cousins was a big part of it. It was that top ten defense. They don't have a lot of parts to uh, that they need to improve on on that on that defense, making a, a quarterback in the first round uh, justified. Yeah, and and I'm I'm with I'm more with you along the lines of uh, Kirk Cousins, Dan, than I am with Kyle. I would uh, pass on him as well. And I think even Kyle mentioned this, but I am not really for Kirk Cousins franchise tagging him because is he worth twenty million for the tag value? Absolutely not. Uh, they really need to negotiate a more realistic contract with Cousins uh, when possible because I really wouldn't want him to to lose him to free agency because I think he is a pretty good quarterback, but. Uh, unfortunately for the Redskins, they made the playoffs, and they're not going to really be getting a very high draft pick in the first round this year. So um, I'm I'm looking at more of a quarterback. I think they definitely need to draft a quarterback, uh, second, third round, whatever, uh, whatever it may be, uh, just to get a backup plan because I think they're going to let RG three walk. Um, and you know I, I don't want to lose Cousins, but I'm not paying him twenty million dollars. So I will find someone else on the on the team or or through even through free agency. Or or possibly a uh, again a rookie through the draft before I pay twenty million for Kirk Cousins and and you know I'm I'm kind of also kind of with Kyle because I look for a reason I look for a further reason to even justify um, why to pass on Kirk Cousins and I have to admit he was I think a, a large reason why the Redskins did have some success but. Uh, yeah, they were in a in a uh, division where eight games would have won the division too. So uh, you know, not real tough. So, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to pass on Kirk Cousins and the franchise tag as well. Next up, here's a big one: Von Miller. Uh, I'm going to go to Dan first on this one. Uh, you got to pay the man, especially after bringing home the MVP in the Super Bowl. Uh, I, that I mean, he's going to get the franchise tag. I think that's uh, it's whether or not he's going to get a long term deal after the franchise tag. Uh, I mean, he's had double digit sacks in four of his five seasons, and the in the one season he didn't, he only played nine games. So uh, I mean, I think he's proven over over his young career that he's going to be worth the money. 
Yeah, uh, I'm I'm with you there. I say you got to pay them. You got to tag them um, unless you negotiate another contract or some sort of extension. But it makes good business sense for Denver. And uh, you know, I, I just I feel like. I would tag him. He's going to get comparable pay, I think. I mean, $13 million, I think, is going to be the number, roughly. It's nothing to sneeze at. And I would do it based on filling out him and his agent. I don't want to jeopardize any kind of future negotiations with him. If he feels slighted by the franchise tag, then I may... I may think of other ways uh, or just reconsider, but I, I think the, the business sense of it and kind of a no-brainer is to tag him. But again, I, that's someone I think I want on the team for quite some time to come, and I would kind of fill out him and his agent and make sure that's not that he's not going to in no way feel slighted uh, by that franchise tag where he may look to walk uh, another day. So uh, you need to lock him up, though, long-term. That's the bottom line. However you need to get there to do it, you need to do it. Kyle? Yeah, I completely agree. you got to pay the man. Uh, he Super Bowl MVP. Dan mentioned it. Plus, you know, it's not going to be too difficult for them to pay him either. From what I understand, no matter what happens, I think we kind of already know that Peyton Manning won't be with the team next year. He's either going to be a retired player or he's going to be playing somewhere else. Because I think that those are the early reports, at least, that that if he does decide to come back, he ain't, he isn't going to be with Denver. Um, that gives him a little bit of cap room to pay Von Miller. And I think it goes without saying that the reason why they won the Super Bowl was because of their defense. Big reason why their defense was good is because of Von Miller. Logic necessitates that you pay this guy. Um, he he definitely deserves it. I, I think I think what you're saying is you know kind of very true. You don't want to slight him. You want to make sure that you please him. You want to make sure that he's the type of guy that isn't going to feel like he's being uh, thrown to the side by a franchise tag that a lot of other players tend to get when the teams are just trying to figure stuff out. If you need to pay him long-term money with a big contract, you do it. He's the type of player. He's he's a, he's a prestige defensive player in this league. And a lot of guys do feel slighted by the franchise tag. They feel like they can get more money, you know, out, you know, otherwise through negotiations, through extensions, or you know, through free agency, what have you. So, uh, and I'm not saying that's the case here with Von Miller. I and mean, like, you know, I don't think uh, the payday that he would get with the franchise tag is anything to sneeze at. Let's stick to our Super Bowl theme and uh, Josh Norman. Uh, what do you guys think about him? Uh, just real quickly, I, I'm going to say pay that man as well. You got to do whatever you got to do. You can't let him go. And 13 million is not a bad payday for him either when you consider like Daryl Rivas, um, Patrick Peterson, they're making right at $14 million, so uh, that's nothing to sneeze at. He, he, that, that's pretty comparable pay for him um, unless, you know, you're uh, unless you're in, unless you're in serious jeopardy of losing one of your other top five players through free agency. If you're the Carolina Panthers, then I'd say tag Norman. Now, if you are in jeopardy of possibly losing another top five player in free agency, I don't know exactly how their contract situation looks out. I haven't really looked at it, but if you're not in jeopardy of losing, you know, a top, like I said, a top five talent on the Carolina Panthers, then I say you go ahead and tag Norman and pay him about the thirteen million that that would entail. Yeah, I agree. I, I would definitely pay the guy, too. Uh, definitely emerged as a shutdown cornerback this year. He's one of those guys, though, when you look at his stats, they're not incredible. That's the thing I was researching a little bit. But the reason for that is because he is such a good quarterback. Quarterbacks don't throw his way. So if you're one of those people who like to look at stats to justify whether or not to pay somebody, you're not going to find it with Norman. But if you actually watch the game, you could tell just how impactful he was on the field. He's someone you definitely have to pay. He's one of their best defensive players. Another Similar to Denver, I mean, Cam Newton's Cam Newton was great this year. Big reason why the offense was successful, one of the highest scoring offenses in the league, but a big reason why they got there was their defense as well, and Josh Norman led that charge. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm with both of you guys. I, shutdown corners are, are somewhat like franchise quarterbacks, hard to come by. Uh, so when you have one, it is rare. you got to lock them up. Um, I mean, he's also, I think, uh, he's not talked about enough as a leader of that defense. Uh, just the way uh, I mean, he he was in, in the pregames with the bat, the whole the whole situation, bringing the bat out. I mean, <laughs> that might have that pumped up the defense, but that was supposedly, from what I've read, that was him doing that. So I mean, he what he means to the defense is is justifies it, the tag in, in itself. All right, we're all in agreement there. Uh, bounce it back to Kyle Alshon Jeffrey, uh, Chicago Bears wide receiver. What do you think about uh, tagging him? Whew, this was a tough one for me. I went back and forth. I, I settled on pass. Um, it has nothing to do with his talent. Absolutely nothing to do with his talent. He's he's top ten wide receiver in this league when healthy. He's definitely a good player, but it's the when healthy part that makes me pass. I mean, I I, I feel like. 
we were talking about before about, you know, we just, we just mentioned it's hard to come by a good shutdown corner. I don't feel like it's as hard to come by a really good wide receiver. I feel you can draft a good wide receiver. You can usually find receivers later in the draft that you can get. This was just another injury riddled season for him. He was under a thousand yards, only four touchdowns the full season. No, no game in which he had more than one touchdown either, which really isn't like a you know the worst type of stat. But for someone of his talent, you'd feel like he'd do a little bit more. But that's because he was injured. I just I with with his injury risk, I would not pay him any type of long term money. I'd let somebody else take on that risk. Right, I I I, I would pay him. Um, his his injury history aside, I mean the franchise tag is. Uh, I mean, one season you got to hope. Obviously, that season he is he is healthy. But I think, uh, what else do you have when you're you're the Chicago Bears wide receivers? I mean, there's just there is nothing else um, promising uh, that's on that roster. I know you can draft some, um, but year one with a aging quarterback and Jay Cutler, if he even will be their quarterback next season. Uh, I mean, they're kind of in somewhat of a rebuild wind now. Who knows what's going on there? So. Uh, I think for the for the talent that he is, uh, you'd lock him up for the season. Yeah, I'm more along the lines with Dan on this one. Um, I just think, and Dan hinted on it, um, you almost have to. Uh, Forte, you let him walk. You let Brandon Marshall walk last year. You have an aging Jay Cutler, as Dan just said. I'm not sure. I mean, you're letting all of your talent go in the Chicago Bears. If you if you choose not to tag Jeffrey and to keep him, um you know, I just I don't know what else what else you have to lose. Uh, I don't know who else you would tag if that's the case. I just think you're you're barely holding on if you're the Chicago Bears and you're almost to the point where you're slipping into irrelevancy. And the the move to let Forte walk really puzzles me there. So, and I, I think also if you let Jeffrey go or if he does eventually end up leaving, uh, I mean. Uh, if you're Jay Cutler, you just got to throw your hands up. You know, <laughs> I'm only Jay Cutler. I'm trying my best out here, and you've let all my talent walk in the last couple of years. So uh, I- I'm also in favor of tagging me, Sean Jeffrey. Let me ask you guys a quick question, though. So if you tag Jeffrey, right, let's say he has a completely healthy season coming up. Do they make the playoffs with Jeffrey completely healthy? No. Uh. I mean, I guess you got to see how their off season is. You never know in the NFL. I mean, the amount of teams that aren't playoff teams that become playoff teams the next season is a vast number. I think it's over fifty percent. So I think you have to see how their off season plays out. And can Jay Cutler stop throwing to the other team? Uh, I mean, that's that's the biggest question. But I say Jeffrey gives them a better chance. Yeah. Well, and I would agree with that. I'll say no, but it, it, with Jeffrey, I think it gives them a better chance. But they still got a lot of work to do with that Definitely. roster. Yeah. I was before gonna say, I say, but it, Jeffrey yeah. is only twenty six years old, so you tag him for a year. He's twenty seven coming out of it. If he proves to be healthy, that's where you lock him up for maybe a four year deal, and maybe by that time your roster is good enough to be able to compete for the playoffs or at least the division title. Yeah, and if you, I mean, you could replace him possibly uh, through the draft. Uh, I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if that's going to happen because he is a, I think he is a pretty elite talent. But at some point, you you have to cling on to some of your talent if you're the Chicago Bears because I know the fan base has got to be getting frustrated as well, and, and that's the ones who are probably in the corner of Jay Cutler. I know there's probably a lot who are not in the corner of Jay Cutler, but you have Jay Cutler, then you let all the talent walk. Um, it, that's a tough situation. But, yeah, uh, Kyle kicked us, kicked us off talking about Alshon Dre- Jeffrey, saying that this is a tough one. So um, let's move on. Uh, Eric Berry for the Kansas City Chiefs. What do you guys think about Eric Berry? Tremendous comeback year this year, uh, battling all that he went through. Uh, what what did the Chiefs, Chiefs situation look like with Eric Berry? Uh, I have pass. I would uh, I would not tag him. Um, you know, coming off of, of what a comeback he made, without a doubt. But at the same time, I know he was a pro bowler, but what is a pro bowler nowadays? I mean, he had the lowest tackles of his career in the games that he actually – um, the season that he played, 55 tackles. Um, his stats weren't very becoming of, of what he had shown previously. Um, didn't even force a fumble, um, which is something that, you know, he's known as a hard-hitting, hard-hitting safety. Um, so I wouldn't – I would not uh, pay him. Kyle? Yeah, um, this is another tough one for me. I, I, I'm going to go with pay. Um, just 
just because he's such a good talent. And and I think that, you know, this was a resurgent year, not only for Eric Berry coming off of, you know, obviously the cancer treatment, but for the Chiefs in general, he's a he's he's the type of guy that I feel like if they let him walk, not only would the fan base not like it, I think his team wouldn't like it. I think there would be a lot of I, I definitely I definitely think his teammates view him as a leader. So I think there'd be a lot of pushback from the team from the team and the different players on the defense if they let him go. Um, if we're talking about the idea of, you know, Alshon Jeffrey being kind of a one year trial period, I think it almost definitely uh, applies to Eric Berry. He's you know, again, again, you know, what is Pro Bowl, but he still did make the Pro Bowl. He still was one of the best safeties in the league. You got to at least give this guy the year. Um, see, you know, hope that he stays healthy the whole year, you know, whether it's on the field related uh, injuries or off the field sickness. Um, you know, he's the type of guy that definitely deserves that type of, you know, at least a trial period and definitely a longer payday in the end, I think. And I'm with Kyle on this one. Uh, I'm tagging him. I'm paying him. If no other uh, reason except to maybe show him a little bit of loyalty after his incredible comeback. And again, with his health off the field, you never know. I mean, everyone, everyone in the NFL is playing days are numbered. Uh, with Eric Berry going through what he's gone through, he, who knows? Who knows how many years he has left? And it's just great to see them. He, he did battle back. He did make a Pro Bowl. And, you know, the money that he'd be getting would be nothing to sneeze at uh, for for Eric Berry. I mean, he's, with the tag value, that's going to be a pretty hefty payday and uh, puts you right up there at the top of the league pretty much in safety. So I don't know. They may have other options, but Barry, he's definitely would be a yes for me as far as tagging him and keeping him with the franchise because I think he is one of the um, the cornerstones of just the makeup and feel of that Kansas City Chiefs team. Uh, so, yeah, I would say tag him. Again, there may be other options, but I'm going with yes, pay Eric Barry, keep him on staff. And the last one I have is Gary Barnkowski, <laughs> <laughs> as uh, as we've been calling him. Of course, it's Gary Barnage, tied in from the Cleveland Browns. Um, Kyle, exp- expl- go ahead and make your pick and explain how the Barnkowski got started. Okay, well, the Barnkowski thing started. And let me make it very clear, I'm the only one of the three of us who knew this nickname. Was the, like That's the absolute fact, so I'm a little disappointed <laughs> to two of you that you didn't know this. Um, Barnkowski. Kyle, I read it four different times and even made notes, and right here, even typed it out, Barnkowski, yeah. and yeah. and I knew his name was Barnage and didn't even pick up on it, so I think that has something to do with him being a Cleveland Brown. I just Brown, thought it was a know? mystery person. I had to Google him to see if I'm he existed. i guys off. What team does I mean, he play for? What did you find, Dan, when you Googled Barnage? I actually did find some Barnage and, and a little Gronkowski. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's that's where it comes from. The idea that he's kind of a, he kind of looks like Gronkowski for some sort of obvious, not so subtle reasons. Um, but he's definitely a good, he, he had that kind of similar type of play style to Gronk. So it just, I think I was listening to some sort of podcast where it came up and it, it just stuck with me. I've only been referred to him as Gronkowski. Uh, as far as passer, uh, uh, as far as passing or tag, I'm, I'm gonna go with pass on on Mr. Uh, Barnkowski. Uh, he, you know he had a great season, definitely a great season. Easily, easily the Browns' best offensive weapon. It wasn't even close. Uh, definitely swung some fantasy seasons too for a couple of people, I'm sure. Um, but he's 30 years old. He has no record of sustained success as anybody i mean this is his I, i'm not sure exactly what season this is for him but he, again with being 30 he's been in the league for a little bit um and this is the only season he's had with any sort of real noticeable success noticeable production i pass on Bar- on barkowski yeah kind of kind of a jordan cameron type breakout year where you that that may be it you know uh we just don't know uh, Dan, what do you think about mr barkowski yeah I, I i would definitely pass um the only tight ends uh, worth tagging are named Gronkowski. Really, um, there's there's not too many, um, and uh, he might have been a, a part of their offense in 2015, but that was the Browns' offense. You have Josh Gordon coming back, so that's that's a weapon you're gaining. Yep. Uh, and then it's just it's just the Browns. It's not uh, there's no reason to keep a, a 30 year old tight end. 
Well, you guys have kind of talked me out. I totally agree with you, but I'm saying pay him. I don't really have a whole lot on this topic, <laughs> but um, he was the, again, you just said he was the best offensive player on the Browns team. And are, are we 100% sure that Josh Gordon is coming no, back? No, no. His, his papers have been filed. We're just awaiting Goodell, who's probably taking his, his sweet time. But uh, I supposedly from everything I've heard, he's been clean. He's, he's done the steps that he's needed to do exactly how he's needed to do them. Um, so I think it's inevitable. It's just a matter of, uh, once he filed his papers, it's a 60 day waiting process, I believe. So I think we're just waiting for that 60 days to hit and then he should be reinstated. Okay, well, let me rephrase. Do we know that Josh Gordon is going to stay clean and do the things <laughs> he needs to do and, and play nice and continue to have an NFL career? Um, but, yeah, going back to Gary Barnage, I mean, I, I don't know. I could take it either way. Like I said, uh, he was the best offensive player on the team last year. The team is just a hot mess. <laughs> I have I wasn't even even considering Josh Gordon come back when I, when I kind of researched this and looked at whether I think I would tag um, uh, Barnage or not. And, you know, and I do think – nine million dollar salary which would, is what the tight end tag would pay him roughly and um, I do think that may be just a little bit extravagant because as Kyle was saying I think it is like his uh, at least it'll be I think at least a seventh or eighth year in the league he's been around a while so uh, but you let him go with the with the confidence I have in this Browns current makeup, and I think they're only scoring nine points a game. Not that, and he had a run; he was kind of up and down too. He had a, a killer stretch there, uh, but even he slowed down as well. But the quarterback was changing every week on him as well. But yeah, I think if you let him go, I have no confidence in your offensive production for next season. You score nine points a game, and uh, but that's why I said pay him. So I would tag Mister Barnkowski, aka. Barnage, <laughs> tight end of the Cleveland Browns. So that was a good segment. Uh, check out more uh, tag information and more NFL uh, information coming up on the website. I know Dan is, is throwing out their uh, player profiles uh, consistently, and the rest of the group will jump on that as well. And do not forget to check us out when we get closer to draft time because we will be all over that, myfantasysportstalk.com. So don't forget uh, to check us out in the months to come. Let's move on. NBA trade deadline review. And the trade deadline was this past Thursday. Uh, not a lot of uh, huge moves. Uh, no really marquee players changing hands. Uh, keeping up with the Grizzlies myself, I think the the trade with Jeff Green and Lance Stevenson was probably one of the bigger trades that went down. And I'm talking literally minutes before the trade deadline. That just came in. I mean, I found out about it after the 2 o'clock uh, Central Time you know, deadline passed. And I'm like, well, man, I, that must have been some really late negotiations there to get that trade through. And it was really kind of a shock, but it made sense for both teams. Uh, and we'll get into more about that. But uh, first of all, guys, uh, what did you see? Did uh, Do you think that was maybe the biggest – impact or biggest whoa uh, type moment from the trade deadline if not what else did you see for me it, it, it for me it really what was it was what we didn't see that was the thing that i think stood out the most to me uh when i was going through this i kind of thought of it in the concept of who won and who lost um the thing that i saw the most was no team really doing anything to challenge the warriors um, I think that's kind of what I got from this. I mean, the only team that's a legit contender, you know, we talked about the legit contenders last week on our uh, lost podcast. Uh, but, you know, and we talked about, um, you know, the, the four teams being Cleveland, uh, the Thunder, Spurs and Warriors. Now, Cleveland and the Thunder both made moves. But to me, it was nothing that was going to really threaten the Warriors stake at being the best team, being the team that you need to look at as a favorite to win. So for me, it was the stuff that didn't happen. I, th I still think you look at this whole makeup of the league as the Warriors being the team to really look at here. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with that. Uh, yeah, not much happened. I'm not sure that anyone could have done anything to really um, dethrone or even jeopardize uh, the Golden State Warriors' chances of uh, holding that trophy in June, though. Uh, Dan, what did, what did you see or kind of shocked you about the trade deadline, uh, either lack thereof or what actually did it happen? Yeah, I think we talked about it. it we knew we kind of, were somewhat expecting a slower, slower trade deadline, and that's exactly what we got. Uh, I mean, the biggest thing for me is finally Markeith Morris is, is off of the Suns. I mean – what took him so long? He was he's been a cancer to your team the whole season. Uh, in a, in a, a lost season, I know our our writer Kevin McQuaid is a huge Suns fan.
fan, uh, and he's been calling for it ever since the season started. Get him off the team. Man, has he. <laughs> <laughs> hey, poor Kevin, man. He has seen a lot of turmoil in Phoenix this year. Oh, God. Uh, man, that that team just um, – yeah, it, I don't know. I don't know what to say. But props to the Suns. I mean, they were able to actually get a pretty decent package for a guy who I would think hold zero value. But you get a protected first round pick out of the deal. Uh, you know, sending them to to Washington, and obviously a couple. Well, it, yeah, and I agree. I mean, I really don't think Dewan Blair and Chris Humphreys are anything to sneeze at. That's pretty good role players. You know, considering the team has kind of been decimated. Uh, find a role for those guys. They both can play. Right. Right. right exactly. Um, yeah, no, it, it, you know, you just mentioned the, the Suns' ability to actually get rid of a guy. I think it kind of goes to the Rockets' inability to get rid of a guy. You know, I, I, you look, they tried. Well, <laughs> they definitely well, tried. They, they tried, <laughs> man. No one wanted to bite, and I don't blame any team. Now, from what I understand, there was a couple of trades that were in the works. I know, I think it was one with the Bucks that was probably sort of going to happen, but it was Dwight's uh, – inability to kind of commit to any type of actual contract with the Bucks or whatever team he's going to go to, which is typical Dwight. I think we all expected that from him. Um, to me, that's the thing that really kind of stood out the most is the idea that, you know, we're talking of this team here, the Rockets, who have been having one of the worst chemistry issues of the entire season, you know, totally underperforming. And, you know, they're, they're trying to get rid of Dwight. That's very obvious. They didn't do it. So now we got Dwight on this team, who's going to be more of a moody guy. Uh, there's rumors of Lawson, too, I think, trying to get moved a little bit. Didn't do it. So this is just going to be more turmoil for this team. Yep, I, I agree. And I'm I'm sure if uh, Dwight and his agent caught wind of that possible a Bucks deal, I'm sure he would have thrown an absolute fit. I don't think there's any way that he would have gone to the Bucks. I'm not sure what Dwight's ideal place would have been uh, if he truly does. I mean, we've heard conflicting reports all year about Dwight wanting out of Houston or no, he doesn't, but I really don't think the Bucks would have been a very logical or, or a desired landing place for Dwight, who has really been around uh, since leaving Orlando, and right now Houston is hanging on to that eighth spot in the playoffs miraculously. Man, if they could have just got it together this year, could have been a dangerous team. I think going into the season, I had them pick probably you know third or fourth because I really thought they'd be a dangerous team, uh, but just just hasn't panned out that way. Uh, but back to the the Grizzlies, which of course you know that's the team I most uh, closely follow, and I think they I think it was smart business decision by the Grizzlies of the deal that they made, a couple of deals they made. They made one on Tuesday, got rid of Courtney Lee. But what the Grizzlies were basically doing was getting rid of Courtney Lee and Jeff Green, a couple of guys that they most likely were not going to afford to pay in the off season to keep or not really wanting to pay as much as possibly Lee and, and Green. You know, would have demanded. Um, and uh, honestly, you know, here in Memphis, they've been trying to trade Jeff Green almost from the get go since they acquired him from the Celtics. Uh, just didn't quite fit in chemistry uh, wise, and they found that out pretty quickly. But anyway, what you get for Courtney Lee and Jeff Green, you had to get something back for them. And I'll be honest with you, this season is really a lost season for a couple of different reasons. Number one, I don't see anybody beating the Golden State Warriors. And I think that's also, uh, as Kyle was saying, what didn't happen during the trade deadline is because what could have teams done to really uh, had a chance to beat uh, the Golden State Warriors this year I don't even Cleveland San Antonio I don't care what you do I'm not really sure anyone is beating that team because that team is rolling um, so basically the Grizzlies get rid of Courtney Lee and Jeff Green for uh, Chris Anderson PJ Harrison Lance Stevenson now those are a couple of guys that are serviceable to get them through this year the other reason it's a lost uh, year is because of course uh, Mark Gasol went down with a broken foot so They'll make the playoffs, but they're not getting any further than that. So we got some serviceable guys. Chris Anderson's getting on up there in age. P.J. Harrison, who knows what he is. Lance Stevenson is a pretty good player, but who knows how he's going to act or if he'll fit in the locker room. So, But anyway, you move those guys, and you basically get two second-round picks and a first-round pick out of the deal. So you've got something in return for a couple of guys who are most likely going to walk at the end of the season. That's where the Grizzlies were coming from. So. Now, despite Dave Yeager saying that it's really not a lost season, it really is. You know, you'll make the playoffs, but you're not going any further than that. And like I said, no one's beating the Warriors this year. Uh, would you guys? Would you guys agree? You know, Kyle, you kind of mentioned that, but do you think there's any move that any team could have made to propel them to one B? You know, if if Golden State is one A in the league, could any team have made a move that propelled them to one B at the trade deadline? I don't think there was a move necessarily that someone could make. I do think, 
even though I said before, you know, I think there was nothing was really done. I think the Cavs did a move that was as good as you possibly can do given the circumstances. I think giving giving uh, getting getting training fry was kind of a good move for them. It gives them a little bit more spacing, gives them a small ball lineup to kind of spread the floor, shoot threes, kind of similar to the way that the Warriors do. They're not going to be able to do it as well as the Warriors, which is what's going to kind of really come down to it when they when they probably meet in the finals. Um, but you know, was there a move that could be made? I don't think there was any of the top tier teams that could have do, done something big. Like the only only other move that was really big that was being mentioned involving a top tier team, from what I remember, was the idea of Cleveland moving Kevin Love, and that wouldn't have helped them beat the Warriors. So I, I don't think there was really anything major that could have been done. Yeah, and you don't do that last minute. You know, you don't make a major move like that last minute on the trade deadline crunch anyway. Damn. See, I, 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 I take the different perspective. I think, I mean, who knows exactly who who is available, but I hated the, the Channing for ideal for the Cavs. Uh, that's, he gives them shooting. He doesn't play defense. You're never going to outscore the Warriors. So you're gaining shoot, shooting for when you really need to gain perimeter defense and be able to try and somewhat slow down, I think, what the Warriors have. Um, so I, I actually didn't like that move. But, I mean, who knows if, you know, if DeMarcus Cousins was available and you trade Kevin Love to, to Sacramento for DeMarcus Cousins and, you know, a whole different package. So getting, if say, if the Cavs were to acquire something like that, I mean, I know it's a dream, but... Uh, if something like that were to happen, I could say, yeah, maybe they could challenge the Warriors, but it's tough in season to find that type of deal. Yeah, and even with the current makeup, uh, I really only think we're talking about maybe a eh, possibly a four-team race. I think Kyle alluded to that earlier in the show. you got Golden State, and then there's everyone else, meaning the Cleveland uh, Cavaliers, San Antonio Spurs, and Oklahoma City Thunder. Outside of those four teams, I don't think there's any way, any chance that anyone else is is, is hoisting the championship in June. I, just, I, I don't see it. So um, you could have seen a quieter period just because the Golden State Warriors have almost emotionally beat <laughs> down everyone else mm-hmm. and um and and submitted them and and saying this is our time you know i don't care what you do this is our time so could have gone either way teams could have uh, panicked and tried to make a move just to compete and i think what more realistically happened is uh teams just said well let's uh, let's not make any moves we're going to handle this in the off season and just kind of wait for the golden state <laughs> warriors to uh get off this hot streak and maybe a piece uh, or two of theirs will become available and uh break up this dynasty a little bit so let's transition from the pros uh, to the guys who play in the college uniforms. The NCAA bubble watch is just about upon us. Always a fun time of year. Who's in, who's out. Uh, first off, uh, guys, just right off the bat, how exciting is Selection Sunday to you? It's always been a huge, uh, one of the hugest days of the year to me, one of the most exciting days. Uh, how exciting uh, is that day to you guys? It's 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 uh, remarkably huge for me. It's a national holiday. Uh, not only Selection <laughs> Sunday, but the uh, the first two days of, of the tournament, the, the, the Thursday and Friday, where games kick off at noon. Ever since I was probably seven years old, I would always uh, <coughs> be sick. Uh, and uh, my mom bought it all the way. Um, so I'm not the only one who still takes off work. Yep, those two my days vacation is submitted. Yep. There you go. There you go. Yeah, awesome. no, it's it is a great free. It's a great time for any kind of sports fan, whether you're a college basketball fan or not. I don't. I don't usually follow college basketball that heavily until it gets time around Selection Sunday and for the actual tournament. But I'm one of those people that will like go on their computer and look at the matchups and look at the strength of schedule and who did they be, who did they be. I I love it. It's definitely one of the funnest times for anyone. And I think that's really undisputable because you look at how many people fill out a March Madness bracket when it comes time. I mean, everybody and their grandmother, literally their grandmother, (laughs) fills out a March Madness bracket. Whether you kind of know what you're talking about, you really think you know what you're talking about, or you're just picking the school colors uh, uh, when you fill out your bracket. But literally everyone fills out a a March Madness bracket, and it really is uh, March Madness. So um, some of the teams... Or don't like it as much because they're sitting on what they call the bubble of whether or not they're going to be in the tournament or not. So let's start out with this bubble watch segment. Again, we're going to have uh, several more weeks of this in uh, podcasts to come. Again, you're listening to the My Fantasy Podcast from MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Brandon Reed, Dan Schalk, Kyle Kirby here. 
Now, some of the teams are going to be in. Some of them are on the bubble. Some of them are going to be out and going to the NIT. We're going to start out this segment, uh, or, or I'm sorry, this this uh, Bubble Watch uh, show this week talking about uh, a couple of American Athletic Conference teams and uh, several SEC teams, and we'll bring you more teams as we get closer to the actual NCAA Sunday Selection show. But first off on this show, we're going to be talking about the Connecticut Huskies. Uh, do you have them in or out, Dan? Uh, I have them in right now. Uh, I I know the the uh, the American Athletic Conference doesn't get. Uh, the best rap necessarily. I think uh, it's it's taken a hit when you look at some of the Power Five conferences, or you know more than Power Five in in, in basketball now. Um, but th- their schedule is is somewhat impressive. I I, I did like that. Uh, um, you know they they have uh, with their nineteen and eight record. Uh, they they've held strong. They've only they've only had uh, t- I see one bad loss. Um, you know, and that's at a Tulsa team that that hasn't been terrible. Um, but other than that, I mean, uh, their losses, nothing has hurt them. Uh, and Tulsa is kind of at at the top exactly. of the um, the American Athletic Conference standings. Yeah. So you have a jumbled mess up there at the top. Yeah, of the I standings. mean, they they lost to Temple twice. Who Temple uh, is the number one team uh, who's had a, quite a resume uh, building wins throughout the the entire conference play. Yeah, um, as far as UConn goes for me, I I, I was conflicted on this one too, but it, I have them in. Now, the reason why I was conflicted is because they did lose twice to Cincinnati, which is another team we're going to be talking about a little bit here. I think that kind of matters, but, I mean, Dan, you mentioned their strength of schedule. I'm looking at it right here. It's 42nd, which is pretty good. Um, and to finish nine, not finish nine, 19 and 8, but to be currently at 19 and 8, you know, it's definitely something, you know, you got to definitely consider. Um I do think there's something to also. I've also I've always kind of looked at the schools with kind of that name recognition. I think that kind of matters a little bit here, and they're one of those schools. I think, especially in this conference, they're usually one of the better te- the better teams to come out. So, I think they're def- I think I think they're in. I'm tentatively saying in. Um, they have to finish strong though. That's the deal. No di- yeah, no doubt. And and I'm going to tell you why they're going to finish strong. I definitely have them in currently 19-8, as Dan mentioned. Uh, they're ranked 24th in the nation, according to KenPom.com, which I go to, uh, go to that website to get a lot of my information. Very good website. Uh, Amita Brima is why I have them currently in and why I have them in when it all said and done. Amita Brima, the big man from UConn, he's just now getting healthy, and he is a difference maker. He's an absolute difference maker. And also, as Kyle mentioned, kind of name recognition. Uh, when UConn gets in the tournament, they've done this uh, several times over the past several years. Once they get in the tournament, they can make really deep runs and win national There's championships. There's a seven seed, so, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think they're just one of those teams that do belong in the tournament. Uh, they're fairly deep. And, again, Amita Brime has kind of been bouncing back and forth, uh, you know, not been healthy all year. But uh, he is the big man, and they've also traditionally had that. Over the last several years when they've made their run, they've had strong point guard play and a strong big man, and they got that uh, this year. And I, I just I think they'll battle through this, and they will continue to get better. I think really right now they're just hitting their stride in the American Athletic Conference. At 19-8, again, Dan said no real bad losses at all. Uh, so I definitely have Connecticut in, and we'll see what happens in the next several weeks. Another American Athletic Conference team, as we just alluded to, is going to be Cincinnati. I do currently have Cincinnati in. They are sitting at 28 and ranked currently uh, 28, according to Ken Palm, and have one of the best players in the American Athletic Conference, Troy Copain. They are ranked uh, 10th in the country in points against. So that is Cincinnati basketball right there. Grind it out and just smother you on defense. And if you, if you don't score more than 55 points, they're probably going to win. And I hate to say this. This really hurts me. You guys are going to know this. Their worst loss is to Memphis. Yep. <laughs> their, their worst <laughs> loss their worst losses to Memphis, uh, and I should never that those words should never come out of my mouth. Uh, I absolutely hate to swallow that pill this year, but it is the absolute truth. Uh, it was in Memphis; they lost by four, and I say that's their worst loss. But you got to remember that was a rivalry game as well. It's always a rivalry game when Memphis and Cincinnati hook up. So even that is not just a terrible, terrible loss. But uh, uh, twenty eight right, twenty and eight right now. 
uh, we'll see how they battle through the remaining portion of the American Athletic Conference. And right now they are sitting in fifth place in the American Athletic. But again, the it's just a jumbled up mess there. You got three teams with ten wins and Temple sitting at top with eleven. But you also got to remember S- SMU will not be uh, playing in either the AAC conference tournament or the NCAA tournament so you can kick them out immediately which I think is going to help Cincinnati because uh, they are right behind SMU so uh, you put them there actually uh, I'm sorry third so uh, really can that's really considered second this year with SMU uh, not eligible for postseason play Dan what about Cincinnati yeah this was this was probably one of the hardest ones uh, of all of them that we that we're doing today Um, I have them out um, it was hard to to say that, but but I do. Um, the Memphis loss was honestly it was one of the biggest reasons. Uh, I mean, I Memphis lost the USF. I mean, you had, <laughs> it looks a lot worse uh, yeah, now, doesn't it's, it? It's, today, today yes. it looks a lot worse. Yeah. So it's it's ultimately going to come down to their last few games. I mean, they end with Houston and SMU at Houston, um, and Houston at nineteen and eight isn't is is doing pretty well uh, in the conference this year. And then SMU ending it, I know it doesn't they don't count, but that another loss. You know, the the selection committee looks at how you end the season um, a lot of times, and or how you're going into with conference tournament play, um, and if they. I'm predicting them to lose those games. So if that happens, I think ultimately they'll be on the the outside looking in. Yep, absolutely agree. It, it depends on how you finish. So they do have to finish strong. Uh, we'll see what happens in the AAC as that all shakes out. Let's move on to the SEC. Kyle, what do you think about LSU, the Tigers' chances of making the NCAA tournament as of right now? You mean the uh, the uh, Ben Simmons Tigers? Is that what we're – okay. <laughs> yep. uh, you know yep. – that that's the reason I have them in, and I don't have them in because they're like a great team. It's pretty clear that Alabama's kind of, kind of quite a bit of a good run here in that conference. Um, but LSU has the best player in the nation. I mean, I think that's I think that's kind of undisputed at this point. I mean, you can argue it if you want to, but consensus number one exactly in the draft. exactly. So I I think that alone gives them enough of a boost to put them up. Now, they have some pretty bad losses on their schedule. I understand that. But when you have a player like Ben Simmons, I feel like it would be cheating the viewers, like myself, to not see what he can do in the tournament by himself. Because you see this a lot. Like, I remember, you know, talking about Marsh Madness and how much you love it. I remember back when Stephen Curry was playing for Davidson, he single handedly brought that team and threw a couple of rounds there. I think we could, not that they're the same player, obviously, but we could see a similar thing with Ben Simmons, just this destructive force deciding to really turn it on and going for it. I'll give you another similar name, Kevin Durant. Yep. Uh, Texas made a run, Kevin Durant's one year that probably had they probably had no business making, uh, but single handedly, uh, absolutely. Um, so Dan, LSU. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of on the same line as as Kyle. I think ultimately uh, LSU will make it in solely because of the Ben Simmons name. The NCAA is is about money, and ultimately he's going to draw more ratings in. So I think that's going to be the ultimate judgment. I mean, it's it's tough to say that they're basing their judgment on that, but I think that's going to be a heavy factor. And it's ultimately going to come down to, again, how they finish. And they have a big contest coming up against Florida, who I know is another one of our, our bubble watch teams. Uh, so that one coming up will, will probably uh, be a big factor in between those two uh, who, who makes it. Yeah, and I 100% agree with you guys. I do want to see Ben Simmons in the tournament. Right now, I do have them out of the tournament. I think the magic number for them is 21. They got to get to 21 wins. Right now, they are 16 and 11. Uh, I do think they have a bad loss to College of Charleston, what I would consider a bad loss. Now, they only lost to Oklahoma by two, but they seem to be trending down uh, lately. Lost three or four. To Alabama and Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, Alabama and Tennessee, uh, two teams that yeah, you probably got to beat if you want to make the NCAA tournament. So, uh, I say all that to say the SEC tournament is going to mm-hmm. decide their fate. I think they have to win two, ter- two games in the SEC tournament, uh, which is very possible, and get that win total up to 21. So uh, February 22nd, I'm saying it right now, LSU has to get to 21 wins and they're in. If they don't, then I think they are out. Next up in the SEC, what about Florida? Um, I currently have them in. Good, solid team. And I've been very impressed with uh, 
first-year coach Mike White. I mean, most of you probably know it's been a long, long time since Billy Donovan did not coach the Florida Gators, uh, and he was, you know, a, a great coach. So, uh, first-year coach Mike White, and don't really have any horrible losses to the Gators. Are 17 and 10, currently ranked 36 according to KenPom.com, um, and they have a chance to solidify a tournament berth because they do host Kentucky. That's coming up next Tuesday. I think that's March 1st, if I have my calendar right. But anyway, next Tuesday, they will host Kentucky. Uh, they have a huge chance there. Win that game, I think you're in pretty much no matter what. Yeah, I uh, I have them in too. And solely the, the, the biggest reason was that West Virginia win. Uh, they they beat West Virginia eighty eight to seventy one earlier on in the season, but at the same time, anytime you can show that you can beat a Big Twelve team, I think that shows that you can hang uh, in the tournament. And that the Big Twelve this year, I think, is hands down the, the best conference in in all of college basketball. And West Virginia is a top ten team. I think they are actually ranked ten right now. Uh, yep, right there in the mix of they everything. They blew them out. I mean, that wasn't even a contest. Um, they ran them up and down the floor. Uh, so I think uh, that, and like you said, they don't really have a bad loss. I mean, you can look at Tennessee, you know, but it's a way game, and I know Tennessee is a tough place to play. Um, so that that's not going to hurt them too much. Um, but the biggest thing I like about them too is the senior leadership. I know Dorian Finney-Smith. Uh, I love watching that guy play, not only with the with the points, but you know, he'll he'll grab some boards for you too. And let me also tell you something about the younger backcourt. I keep up with these guys because their point guard, Chris Chiosa, mm-hmm. is actually from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, another uh, guy that uh, Memphis let slip away, so he <laughs> went to the Florida Gators, and now he's the starting point guard and uh, doing very well in the SEC. And also another guy, I think is a freshman right now from Little Rock, Arkansas, is Kevon Allen. So that makes up your backcourt for the Florida Gators, and they are solid. Uh, so, uh, And again, under Coach Mike White, uh, just, I think they're a very solid team, and I think they will deserve to be in the uh, NCAA tournament. So, uh, again, next Tuesday, big uh, showdown with Kentucky. They win that game in Florida, and I think they're going to be in. Lastly, out of the SEC, Vanderbilt, the Commodores. What do we think about Vandy? Are they in or are they out? I uh, personally, I have them out. They have a couple of big wins, uh, but you look at their remaining schedule here. If I got this right, I'm pretty sure they have A&M, Florida, and then Kentucky left. It's going to come down to these three games. They can easily get swept in those three games. If they get swept, they're out. If they can win one of the one of the three, it's up in the air. If they can win two of the three, they're in. So it's really going to kind of come down to these last final three games for them. Um, you know, as a whole, strength to schedule is 50. You know, it's good. It's not great. Um, you know, we're looking at a team like Florida from before. They had just the ninth ranked strength of Samuel. So that team, you know, if you're talking about pairing the two of them, you're gonna have to give it to one. You got to give it to Florida there. Um, but you know, Vandy, I, I, I have them, I have them out. But we're gonna have to wait until these three games. It's gonna come down to these. If they get swept, like I said, there's no way they're even. Yeah, and I agree. You're hitting on that point that I wanted to make as well. I have them currently out. They're 16-11. Now, you mentioned the strength of schedule, which is pretty good. It's not bad, and I think that's the reason Ken Palm has them ranked at 29th in the nation right now uh, because the strength of schedule has not been that bad. Uh, But at 16-11, with the upcoming schedule you just mentioned, I have them playing Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, which is no slouch, uh, and Texas A&M. Uh, you know, so I have them going one and three out of those last four games. I have them losing to, uh, I think, a better Florida team, have them losing to Kentucky, and I have them losing to Texas A&M. So I have them finishing the regular season at 17 and 14. Uh, that's not getting in the tournament. In my opinion, that's not getting in the tournament. Uh, so uh, Vanderbilt is out uh, as far as the way I see it. Dan, yeah, I have them out as well. Uh, they're coming in hot into this stretch. I mean, they've won three or four, but I mean, you guys have hit the nail on the head there. Uh, I mean, it's going to depend on, on how they finish. If they could, if they could win a, a couple of these games, you know, going into conference tournament play on a hot streak, like I said, winning three or four games, uh, they could be viewed as a dangerous team and something that the selection committee looks at. Um, but they will have to keep this hot streak going a little bit. 
man, it's exciting talking about March Madness time just around the corner. Uh, and the tournament time is always one of my favorite times of the year. you got spring springing <laughs> up, you know, the, the weather changing, which I know you New York guys cannot yes. wait to happen. Uh, as I was telling Dan uh, before, and Kyle uh, caught this as well, here in Arkansas, we are already dealing with mosquitoes. I kid you not, it's February 22nd. Had four or five swarming around me just the other day. So uh, spring springing, March Madness, can't wait. And don't forget, we're going to be bringing you more bubble watch teams as the weeks come, and we try to nail down just who the field is going to be in this year's NCAA tournament. So that's going to do it for this podcast. Thanks so much for joining us uh, You're and listening to the My Fantasy Podcast brought to you by MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Do not forget to visit our page. Again, we've opened it wide up. It's not just fantasy. It's not just sports. It is entertainment in general. So check us out. Thanks for listening. This is Brandon Reed for Dan Shaw and Kyle Kirby. We'll see you next time. MyFantasySportsTalk.com.